Mommy Millionaires. I am so excited to bring you this special episode. We are recording a podcast live and we even have some Millionaire Society members here watching it with us. And you guys, I want to remind you that if you have been craving community, you want to make sure to get your ticket to Mommy Millionaire Live. You guys can head to mommymillionaire.co and pick up your tickets today before they sell out. But today we have a very special guest. His name is Dan Nitro Clark. You guys, he is a professional athlete turned actor. He's best known for his time on American Gladiator. So yes, you may have seen him in red spandex with sequins. And you know what that tells me? He is a confident man. And we're going to be talking all about mindset today. I'm so excited to have you on the show, Dan. So well, thank welcome. you. Well, first of all, you must not have seen a lot of my acting work because you called me an actor. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, I've learned, you know, as I, as I age gracefully that spandex is a privilege, not a right. <laughs> I, I've hung up those spandex, I've retired them, but for very special occasions. I bring them out. We're going to bring it onto the video just so everybody can get a flashback, okay? So I'm excited to have you on because I was just on your podcast a couple weeks ago and we got, we talked about a lot of stuff and one of the things that connected us, I think, was we had a kind of a similar childhood. You grew up in a pretty rough environment. So, you know, you've had all this success in the world now and what makes you is what you went through, you know, as a child. That's what made you so driven and ambitious. So can you take everybody back that's unaware of what you went through to create, you know, such an amazing life? Well, well thank you for saying it's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, the definition of success has changed. Before, success was about just acquiring things, you know, the bigger house, more cars, the vacation homes, and yeah. that left me a little bit empty. You know, I wanted to uh, have love, connection, happiness, and meaning in my life. But that was hard for me because if you go way back, the moment who I became who I am today was when I was 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, uh, I come from a divorced family. Mm -hmm. I come from a father who was a Marine and who was an alcoholic, but who also had wonderful moments of, of grace and, and love. So it made it really complex. But when I was 10, my older brother, Randy, who was my hero, who was my rock, who was everything to me. Uh, he was with me from home to home through the divorce when we went to different countries. He got into an electrical accident when we were playing on the roof and he died in my arms. That's horrible. And that moment created such a emptiness inside of me that I didn't know how to fill. Mm -hmm. And my dad, like I said, he was a Marine, and, and he never once said, you know, hey, son, this is going to be hard. You've lost your brother. We're going to get through this. My mother's Japanese. I love her to death, but her culture is not about emotions. So the way I fortified myself, the way I got strong, mm -hmm. was I built this meat suit, yeah. this muscle suit, all to protect that little kid inside of me mm -hmm. who had to learn at 10 years old to survive in the world. Mm -hmm. So you just decided I'm going to become strong physically on the outside, but what was going on on your insides? Well, you know, it was interesting. That it didn't, at 10, I didn't say I'm going to go, you know, be Schwarz, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> get the chopper or any of that stuff. What, yeah. I, what, what I knew is that I was lost in the world, that I didn't feel loved. That's at 10 is also when I started to drink. My dad had a restaurant and I saw him drinking to kill the pain. So in your mindset is that's what I need to drink to kill the pain. Yeah. So I started drinking too. This is what Did my dad Did he know you does. were drinking? No. I go in there at night in the restaurant when it was closed and open up the bottles and try it and, and, and drink. Um, and that was to, that was crazy. to, that was to kill the pain. Um, but it took a long time. So the first way I knew how to feel good about myself, mm -hmm. right, was, and I know you're a big fan of this because we discussed this, was I visualized. When I was in high school, I was on the verge of freshman, verge of dropping out of high school. Mm -hmm. I was still drinking, I was doing more drugs. I was cutting school. I had quit the football team, because my, my dad wanted me to play sports. Why'd and you quit? I quit because nobody cared. Oh. And because I was terrible. I was fat, I was overweight, I, could, I wasn't playing. You weren't feeling significant doing it, so why do it? Right, I, I wasn't playing. Yeah. So, so I quit in the middle of the season. I just came home one day and I was like, hey, I quit. Nobody said anything. Then I got lucky, I met a mentor. 
And he taught me, he was a hypnotist back in like in the 1978, 1978, way before you were born. <laughs> back when it was like a, like a dirty word. What, what is hypnotize? What, what is visualization? And he put me through a session. And for the first time in my life, I was successful, but it was in my mind. Mm -hmm. And he's taught me that that was the power to manifest what you wanted in your life. So that spring, I worked out, I trained, and I added that one thing. Every single day, I would spend 20 minutes seeing the success that I wanted. And as, as a 14-year-old kid, it was on the football field. And I made it very, very uh, sensorily aware. And the next year, one year later, my sophomore year, using that one tool of visualization, mm -hmm. I went from too fat to play, cutting school, drugs, to the most valuable player on my team. Wow. One year with that tool, and I've never stopped using that tool. That's amazing. So many people, they hear us talk about visualization, and they want to complicate it. They think it can't be that simple to change your life. What do you say to somebody that's listening in right now, and that's their objection? Like, yeah, I, right. Yeah, you know, Kayla, I've seen it too many times in my life where it, it, it's all anecdotal evidence, but I've seen it in my son's life. I've seen it in the people I've coached their lives. I've seen it so many times it, it, it is true to me it is a fact now here's the trap people fall into mm -hmm. you know the secret all you do is visualize and it happens right you have to work you've got to put your head down you've got to break things like we both do into small bits right mm -hmm. you've got to go forward but it creates a different neural pathway in your brain than anxiety and worry does you got the good brain and the bad brain yeah right so that visualization it, it, it helps manifest 100 percent. i wouldn't be sitting here today if I didn't visualize. I actually visualized today. I visualized uh, us having a, a, a good thing where energy flowed, where we were giving out good information and impacting people listening. Me too, me too. That's awesome. Okay, so you become MVP of the football team. How do you end up on the Rams playing professional football and then land on the American Gladiator show? I mean, that's so crazy. Like you wouldn't think where you came from that you would have accomplished that. A lot of people stress because they don't feel like they have found their purpose. They don't feel like they have a plan. Mm -hmm. I had no plan. I had no purpose. Um, when I finished high school here in Orange County, I got a job working at a kiosk in Sears selling metal etchings. I was still dating the head. What is that? Metal etchings were like paintings, like oh, this weird okay, painting okay. thing. Yeah. And I was making $400 cash a week. I was still dating the, the head cheerleader. She had of a course, job. That's so classic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> she had a job at uh, Ralph Lauren, and she got like seventy percent off clothes. So I was getting discount clothes at four hundred dollars in my pocket, and I'm like, I'm set. <laughs> and the way life works, if you're an optimist, and, and I believe um, that optimism is a learned trait, is I always knew something good would happen, and I believe that. And one day, even though I thought I was, you know, I was done, my football coach from high school walks by, and he says, Hey. I'm coaching now at the junior college, Santa Ana Junior College down the street. You were pretty good. You should come play. At that time, I had no dream, no desire to play. I was going to sell etchings and date the head cheerleader until the rest of my life. But it, it, it started to work. And then I said, you know what? Two weeks later, I'm going to go try out. I went and tried out. was still pretty good. And then one thing led to another. Wow. Wow. So it was like another mentor coming into your life and kind of speaking belief into you. Yes, from, from the oddest, strangest place. Mm -hmm. I'm at Sears yeah. <laughs> working. He happens to walk by and he gives me the information and I take it and I took action on it. Yeah, another mentor. That's so I, I feel like I didn't have a good father figure. So in my life today even, I, I'm always seeking out mentors. Mm -hmm. I'm always kind of idolizing men who I wish, and I, you know, my dad's passed away, who wish they would be the father I didn't have. Mm -hmm. I love that. And in turn, I feel like I've finally become the father and the man I wish my dad was, you know, to my son. Mm -hmm. and to, How old's your son? Oh, my son's, uh, he's 31. And what does he do? He's an attorney. Oh, I love it. Yeah, he's not, well, okay. So he's an attorney, right, Kayla? But he doesn't practice law anymore. He went to law school, passed Praise God. That's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. He went to law school, passed, got out and, and practiced for a year and says, I don't like this. Then he went into and started another business. So he's an attorney by background, but he's an entrepreneur and he's crushing it. That's awesome. But the key thing, you know, with my son, you know, my son is I wanted him to be happy. 
I wanted him to have, uh, have purpose in his life. I wanted him to make an impact on the world, much more than just the financial things. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you're you're on American Gladiator. You have your son while during that time, right? During that time, right? Right before. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you balance being a dad and doing this? I got a gift. I got the gift of. Ha I got the gift of having a, another young man in my life right now. My girlfriend has a son who's eight. So that's been a gift where I've got to look at my parenting style between when I was 22 and now. And the thing that I would change the most if moms and dads, when you're listening to this, is when There's I was... A lot listening. Yes, of course there is. When you're listening to this is I used to lead with intimidation mm -hmm. and fear. Most because dads do. that's how my dad raised me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always the fear of the backhand of the belt. And what I've done with my girlfriend's son, we've been together three to four years, is I use the same management and coaching skills of motivation, of uh, inspiration that I do with coaching clients. So give us an example. So I understand how he learns, I understand that he's very reward motivated. Mm -hmm. So what I will do to teach him a work ethic is I will put at a reward at the end, like a, a end of something, like this summer, we had a challenge, a 500 push-up challenge. <laughs> so that, which is, which is huge for, for a kid, oh my God, yeah. I could never do 500 push-ups. Yeah. But what I wanted to teach him was by setting small goals every day, you can climb any mountain, you can overcome any obstacle. I love that. And I put a $50 reward at the end of it. So I taught him a work ethic where if you do you know, 10 push-ups a day for 50 days, you get the $50. Mm -hmm. Now this transfers over to other things in his life. He's got a very difficult piano piece he's learning. And I can look back and say, hey, remember those push-ups? You didn't think you could do it? Just learn this piece every day and soon you'll play beautiful music. So basically what you're saying is, instead of just, I mean, I, I feel like using intimidation and fear to motivate people around us is very easy. It doesn't take much thought. It doesn't take much intention. But what you're doing is you're thinking about everything and putting an intention behind every conversation, it sounds like, you're having. Every conversation, because I know you have three, and they get smart. You think you've handled a challenge, then they give you a new one. Yep. Then you have to up your game. You got to up your game as, as far as coaching and motivating. So that, that's exactly right. And the other thing, um, is mindset, which we talked about. Yeah, we need to talk about that. Huge mindset with him. So instead of saying, oh my God, you're so smart, if he does well on a test and he says it was easy, I say, oh, I'm sorry, they didn't challenge you enough. Oh. So what I've done and continue to do with him is instead of teaching him and praising him with so much, you know, oh, you're so smart, you're such a great artist, I teach him to learn, to love the obstacles and the challenge. Okay. Because through that, he's going to have growth and success. So if something's, if he's frustrated or he's struggling, I said, oh, this is a good challenge. Yeah, oh, man, man, you, you can do this. So it's been a whole, a whole different mindset with him. And it really paid off. He's a great kid. Oh, and my okay. son's great, too. He got through law school and, and he's doing amazing. well. So how do you do that with yourself? Because people listening in right now, they may be in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. They see a challenge in front of them. And they've realized, like, challenges just bury me. You know, so how, how do you help somebody through that? Because just like a couple days ago, I was talking to one of my clients and she has a huge challenge in her business. And what I tell somebody is that challenge is just going to be feedback for you because it's going to help you create better systems for your life. So this challenge isn't going to come up again. What do you say to somebody? So I think the one thing that differentiates people between people who are successful and not the people who overcome the challenges and not is they have the one skill of being able to take action when they don't want to, yes. when they oh don't feel like it, mm -hmm. when they're tired, when they're afraid. Yep. When you can learn that, because we live in a culture now where we everyone talks about passion. Yes. Find your passion, so find your I passion. I get so annoyed, I get really annoyed. Yeah, find your passion. <laughs> and then what's inherent in that is the romantic gesture. If you are passionate, mm -hmm. you're always gonna be fired up, you're always gonna be motivated, you're always gonna wanna do it. Look, right. when you're fired up, that's when it's easy. But when it's hard is when you don't feel like it, which right. is gonna be 90% of the time. 98% of the time. <laughs> so do not fall into that trap of number one,
because all of a sudden you don't feel passionate that this isn't something that's good for you. Learn to push yourself when you don't feel like it, when you're tired, when you don't want to, when you're afraid. And that is the biggest thing to transform your life. And then I also break it down into simple steps. Okay. All journeys, like I did with, with uh, my stepson. 500 push-ups, oh my God, what a challenge. Mm -hmm. What can you do today? What simple action can you do today to take a vote towards the person that you want to become? Oh, talk about that, what does that mean? Take a so, vote. Take a vote, so each day we have a choice. And my motto is if I wake up, because I've had a heart attack and I've almost died. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Each day I wake up, I have a chance. And in that day, I have a chance to prove to myself by taking these actions of the person I want to be. So what I do is I design my days. I don't just go through my day and hope I feel love, hope I feel connection, hope I feel success, hope I feel triumph. Mm -hmm. I design my days. To feel all of those things. Yes. And the way I do that is I know what it takes for me to feel love. I know what it takes for me to feel successful. I know what it takes for me to feel connected. I know what it takes for me to feel, to have inner peace. Mm -hmm. And so when I schedule my day. You have to have structure. I structure my day, but I put, okay, for, for me to feel loved, it means connecting with my son, spending maybe a time with the memory of my mo mother who passed away two years ago. or Sorry. Or it means sitting down at the table and spending a few moments with the phones down where I, I just, with my girlfriend, my partner, and we spend that moment connected. Mm -hmm. So I plan those. I don't hope to have love. For me to feel successful, I put a list of, in the morning, if I crush this, these three things, these one things, I was successful. Right. So I'm very, very in control of my day. And each day I look at it, it's almost like a vacation. You know, if you want to go on that vacation in Hawaii, you've got to plan the damn trip. Right. So I plan each day. I love that. Okay, so all of you guys, mommy millionaires that are watching this, make sure you have structure because it, what I'm hearing is just intention around everything that you do. That's how you become a professional athlete. That's how you raise amazing children is you have to have intention. So let's talk about 2013. You know, you, you have a heart attack and... You took away the punchline. Well, sorry. <laughs> the dramatic story. You're dead. I, di I didn't die. I, I'm still here. He's here. I'm still He's here. here. <laughs> but, you know, you have a heart attack and the next night you're lying in bed and you feel like you want to die. Yes. Why, why was that? Because you've had this successful life up to this point. And what was going on in your mind to feel like, oh, well, you know, life's over now? So, I'm a optimist. Right? I, I am definitely an optimist, and again, we talked about it earlier, I believe that's learned optimism by designing your days, mm -hmm. by putting these positive things. But my whole identity was based around an athlete, someone who's indestructible, football player, American gladiator, CrossFit uh, competitor, champion. And in a snap of a finger, my identity was, was stolen from me. And I didn't know, based upon that, if I wasn't going to live, but be able to live the life I wanted to live, mm -hmm. the things that brought me joy, I didn't know if I wanted to live. And that was when I said those three words, I want to die. So your identity is wrapped up in who, what you were doing. Yes. And so what do you know about identity now, coming out of that and have survived that heart attack? And you know, you have this amazing life now. I had an amazing life, life back then, but I was so busy tra chasing gratification that I never practiced gratitude. I didn't know what gratitude was. Gratitude to me was like, oh, you're welcome. Yeah. I didn't understand how to be grateful for things because I was so busy on that hamster wheel of chasing success. I think everybody listening into this right now is on the hamster wheel. You're on the hamster wheel. And the moment you think you're going to die or that you might, you get to see the world through a different lens. And how it happened to me is that Ambulance brings me to the hospital. I'm lying in the hospital bed, heart attack for about two and a half hours. The, surge, uh, the surgeon comes in and he says to me, we're gonna have to bring you to the lab. You're, you're a former lab, nurse, yep. the cath lab. And I want a reassurance. So I looked at him and I said, hey, I just gotta know, am I gonna die? Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting him to He's say, you, yes. <laughs> we got gotcha. you. I'm expecting no. him to see all these things. And he was just like, look, mm -hmm. I don't know. You've been having this heart attack, we have to get you in there, we have to have surgery, I don't know. And in that moment, 
of really not knowing if I was gonna live or die, so many things became crystal clear. The first thing was, at that moment, I only wanted one thing in my life. I didn't care how many homes I had. I didn't care about the size of my car, the make of my car. I didn't care about the plaques on my wall. I only wanted the people that I loved close to me, and I wanted them to know how much I loved them. Nothing else mattered. And uh, Kayla, That's so crazy, huh? I'm so grateful for that experience because I feel like I got the answers to the test before the test. And then over the next six so months, it was a gift. It was a, oh, it was a gift. It, it, again, learned optimism. You know, I say the heart attack was the best thing that happened to me. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was at the gym about a year after the heart attack, and uh, my car was getting worked out uh, across the street. And I asked a young kid, when I say young kid, 24 years old, to give me a ride home. And he, we get up to my driveway and he's like, hey, I gotta ask you something, man, you know? You had a heart attack, man, that must have been terrible. And I said, yeah, I was, it was almost dying. And I said that to him, I said, but I think it was the best thing that ever happened to me. He's like, what, no way. You know, how could that be the best thing that happened to me? Dude, you almost died. <laughs> See, you're a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Spicoli. He was like, dude, you almost died. And I said, look, through that experience of having a heart attack, I became a better man, a better father, a better partner, a better friend, a better human being. I learned that what was important to me in life, mm -hmm. I learned to practice gratitude instead of gratification. I also learned that time wasn't guaranteed. I've done a lot of my life, but I fell into the trap a lot of times of saying someday, hey, I'll do that someday. Oh, we'll do that someday. Since then, I dropped the word someday from my vocabulary. If there's something I want to do, I schedule it now. I'm doing it now. I, I schedule it, I say, even if it's two years from now. Like, yeah. one thing I wanted to do all of my life is I want to go to Bora Bora. But it was never the right time. Was it after you saw the movie Couples Retreat? <laughs> no, it was way before, 25 years. <laughs> Oh my God. This is a 25 so year before dream. Bora Bora was cool. Yeah, yeah, this is okay. a 25 year dream. Well, French Polynesia, Bora Bora, mm -hmm. Anthony Robbins has a place there, Marlon Brando had a place there, and he, you know, he bought an island. I said, I gotta go there. But I always said, someday. And then I realized, like I said, time is not guaranteed. And I booked it and I went this last year. Oh, finally. That's awesome. So the system I have for not being a someday guy is you say something to me, and I'll either say yes and I'll figure out how to calendar it, even if it's two to three years from now. And I believe when you narrow your focus down, one, it helps you achieve them, mm -hmm. right? Instead of like you have so many different things. Two, when you have a lot of different things in your brain, it creates anxiety, right? Because, oh my God, how am I gonna get there? What am I gonna do? There's so many different things to juggle. When you can start to narrow your focus down, and when I don't wanna do something, I just say no. I relieve it, I release it to the universe. I said no. So. People listening in right now, they, they're thinking in their head, he makes it sound so easy to just say no, but I have obligations. I have to say yes because, you know, family members or, you know, people that have helped me in the past and, you know, they feel like obligated <laughs> to say yes. <laughs> and that's what happens when you do a live podcast taping. Coffee, coffee cups break in the background. It's all good. So we're talking about, you know, basically giving yourself permission to say no. Um, you say yes to the things that you want and say no to the things that don't serve you. For people listening in right now, how, what is the, how do you get to that place in your life where you can just easily say no? Well, if I'm being 100% authentic, it's really hard to say no to that relative. Yeah. That doesn't serve you, that you don't. Um, but what I do is I create boundaries. Yep. So maybe I'll go at Christmas, but I'm not going Thanksgiving, I'm not going to every birthday. It's, for me, it's a lot easier when it comes to the personal direction I want in my life to say no that, to anything that doesn't take me there. What I want at my age, I'm 55 now, is what I've learned the most important thing for me is to protect my inner peace. Yes. So if you're someone who keeps me from being in that inner peace, which I work hard to cultivate, you know, I meditate every day, I, I read, I, that's so important to me. Mm -hmm. And if you, don't, if you keep me from having that inner peace, I don't let you in my circle. It's simple. You have to say, what do you value? Mm -hmm. Do these people add to that value to increase that value or they, do they not? And if they don't, they're clipped. Mm -hmm. it, look, when I was, when I was younger and, and uh, I had a, an addiction issue with drugs in my 20s, you know, TV, Hollywood, all that stuff, the most important thing I did for myself is I cut anybody off in my life who still did drugs. Because I knew my wisdom was, not having it around me. 
I didn't have the willpower once it was there. If we're in the back of the limo, back, back in those days they had limos still. <laughs> it's before cool. Uber. So you're back in the limo and, and if you're like, hey, if you're bringing drugs or something, you know, don't call me. Do not call me because I don't do that anymore. So sometimes we have to have no plan B. This is my plan A. I'm important to me. And too many times people get stuck thinking that self-care is selfish. Self-care, taking care of this vessel, taking care of yourself as a human being so you can present to the world your best self. Mm -hmm. That's self-love, mm -hmm. right? Do you believe you Abs follow? Absolutely, and I think like people think, oh, I'm strong enough to handle all of the, all of the obligations and saying yes to the family members and doing all that, but then they end up frazzled and anxious yes. and yeah, their inner peace is affected. And like my best piece of advice to give people is you have to, exactly what you said, you have to have a clear vision on who you want to become, right? So who is the person I wanna be? And everything that doesn't match up to that, you gotta start saying no to it, right? Yes. So how do people create that clear vision? Because it sounds like to me, like you know where you're going, right? And a lot of people, they still don't. They might be in their 50s, same age as you, and they're going, I don't know. I just, I don't know what I'm passionate about. I don't know what to do with my life. What do you say to them? Here's the trap that people fall into. Gladiator. <laughs> gladiator. Give the gladiator way. Here's the trap that people fall into, and I went through this with one of my uh, other sisters. She is an attorney by trade, but now her kids have left the house, the three kids, empty and she has empty nest syndrome. Mm -hmm. And she's going, oh, I don't know if I want to be a travel companion. I don't know if I, I want to start a silent retreat. And she's spending all of this time figuring out what her next step is. And I said, look, you don't have to decide your next step 100%. Why don't you go and see what energizes you? Yeah. Before you make the decision of starting this whole business, why don't you go work for a company for a few months that is a travel companion? Why don't you uh, go to a couple silent retreats to see if you want to do it? So the big mistake I think people make is like, oh my God, I don't know if I want to be a graphic designer. I don't know, it's God this, that. Go do it for a little bit, go try. And don't worry so much about passion. I focus more on what energizes you, what makes you feel alive. And you're probably gonna have to try a lot of different things, mm -hmm. right? And just know what you decide on may not work out and you may need to pivot and do it again. I've pivoted so many times in my life and I think the new skill set is going to be the ability to adapt, mm -hmm. right? Because the world is changing so quickly. So fast. And I think when you're saying all those things, it sounds so easy. Just try it, try it out. And I know these people in their head, they're thinking they're scared of failure, right? So it's like, well, but if I try the graphic designer job and I'm not good at it and I don't like it, that means I'm a failure. So I'm just not going to try anything new because I'm just, I'm good at making coffee. You know, even though it doesn't energize me, I don't really want to do it. So how do people recuperate from failure? I, I look at failure as just feedback. It's, it's, it's not actual failure in the way that the world makes it seem. Like you're not, you know. I think we have to look at failure. It's not devastating. We have to look at failure as the entree to success. Ooh. Do you know what I mean? We have to look at failure as stepping stones, okay. not stopping stones. Too many times when that we- That was good. We gotta put that on the quote card. Too many times you look at failure as stopping, but failure is really learning. Right, um, Bill Woodich, right, is a friend of ours who wrote the book Fail More, right, and it's all about failing, failing, failing as a way to get towards success. And I can, I, I, and I, I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes I become so concerned about what other people think. Really? People I don't even know about, people I don't care about. You know, I'm like, why am I so worried about what they think? And then I just have to remind myself that through the cycle of progression that failure is just one of the steps. But you only fail is when you quit. That's the only true failure. Right. You only fail when you give up, right? So for me, I've been knocked down a lot of times. And I've learned to get up because I know on the other side of my frustration is success. I've learned to look at failure and frustration as good things. and. Why, why, why is frustration a good thing? Oh my God, frustration is great because you, that means you know there's a way that you just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> 
And, okay. And what I do is I take all that energy that I used to get stuck at and feel frustrated with, and I put it towards finding a solution. Fresh, you're saying frustration is good. And um, I want to know a little bit more about if I'm feeling frustrated in my life right now, my business isn't growing as fast as I want it to go. You know, my, my team isn't working the way that I want them to work. What should I do with that frustration? Because right now I, it's like I go boxing to, to get rid of the frustration. I'm like, I hit, I hit a punching <laughs> bag, okay? Well, there's, there's two parts to this frustration. I think frustration is good because frustration means that you know there's a way, mm -hmm. but you just haven't found it yet. So it's about finding that way. So that's the first thing. So okay. I love frustration because the opposite of frustration is quitting, mm -hmm. is when you've given up. But when you're frustrated, yeah, there's still- Yeah, you're not defeated yet. Yeah. yeah, they're still fighting you. You know there's a way. So when that's I'm frustrated, good. I go, oh God, this is great. Okay, what energy, what can I do right now? What can I, how can I channel this frustration? Now, what you're talking about is boxing to relieve some of the adrenaline dump. So what happens when we get frustrated is the same as anger, it's the same as fear. Your body releases adrenaline, and that adrenaline is, is you know, flight, fight, or freeze. Yeah. And everyone handles that anxiety differently. Some people want to fight. You're the fighter. Boom, I'm, boom, I'm boom, boom. I'm the warrior, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me get this out. Let this reaction system in my body that was has been there for millions of years to keep me safe mm -hmm. let me get this out and stop the cortisol so i can get to be at a more calm place where i can think clearly mm -hmm. some people freeze like deers <gasps> they don't do anything they get what paralyzed do do? <laughs> they get paralyzed and it takes them a while to get that adrenaline out and other people run they run from the problems mm -hmm. so people denial yeah people are, are three things they either fight they either freeze or they run. They do the fight, flight, or freeze, right? <laughs> so the whole idea is you wanna get rid of that adrenaline so you can get back. And it's science. Science says when you slow down the revolutions in your brain, the cycles mm -hmm. of thought, that is when you can get down to being calm, the cortisol gets there, and that's when you can get to effective planning, uh, effective visualizing. So what you're doing is really, really healthy. Okay. So box it out if you guys are frustrated. And then what do they do next? What can I do that I can control right in this particular moment to take a step forward to get the goal that I want? So just focus on that one thing. Focus on the one thing. So many people get stuck in the gap. Yep. The gap between where they are now and where they want to be. Mm -hmm. you, you're out of shape. You you can't walk around the block and you want to run a marathon it mm -hmm. seems so far off that you quit that you don't start mm -hmm. but you have to focus on what can i do today that i'm in control of that will put me one step closer to my goal right start walking the block yes start walking the block i love that okay and i just asked if the audience had any questions and deb wanted to know because she has a son that's an athlete she wanted to know, um, how do you motivate them before a race or a big game? How do you get them mentally prepared? So getting prepared for a big game or any athletic event for anybody, it's not done the night before. It's done with the days of work that you put into it. The game is the fun part. Right? The game is when the time that you have spent exercise, training, all that work you've put in, now it's time to go have fun. So the one thing I've, I did for 25 years and I still do now is I visualize. Okay, so back to the visualization. So you go back to that basic tool of visualizing. So how does visualization work for me as an athlete? Is I relax my body, Okay. I calm my body down. And there's you do that a, just to, through some breath work? Or? I do breath work, uh, but I also use the body part work. So feet relax, legs relax. I, I go through and relax each part of my body. Okay. And then I go down and I follow my breaths. Then I visualize a clear picture of the success that I want. So if he's a football player and he's a quarterback, he would visualize throwing passes, receiver catching it, the fans cheering, his mom, Deb, clapping and screaming, that's my boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you go through that process of visualization. But the mental game, I think, is something, a skill that we don't put near enough time on. Everybody's always into the physical game. Everybody's always into the work so game. True. But that, we're both big visualizers. I know I had you on my podcast. And that mental game, they say that exercise is 20% of health, 
where diet is 80%. Mm -hmm. I would say the same thing. Visualizing is 20%. The other 80% is actually doing things. It's that important. Okay. I love that. So we got to be visualizing more every single... How much do you, time do you spend a day visualizing now? Woke up at 5.30 this morning <clears throat> and I spent uh, 24 minutes visualizing. Okay, I love that because, it, you know, everybody, you, this is the most simple thing that we could be doing every single day. And I ask people all the time, I have like hundreds of people that are in my groups and I'll say, visualize. And I'll ask them, did you do it? No. Nope. They, they put it off. They resist the visualization. So what do you say to them? Another trap is sometimes when we think things are too simple mm -hmm. that they won't give us the results. But it's the simple things done daily. Yeah. It's the bricks you lay each day brick that, brick. I love that builds the foundation that you're going to stand on and present to the world. So learn to love the simple things. Mm -hmm. Do them day after day. And like I said, really prove who you want to be each single day. You want to be each and every day because that's transformation right mm -hmm. people think transformation is overnight mm -hmm. but it's not it's done day after day hitting a single after a single it's laying a brick it's making a deposit each day into the bank of your future mm -hmm. and that's done through these simple simple little actions I think that boredom is the enemy of success absolutely boredom we get so bored oh I just did this I just did this and again it's doing those same things just over and over and over again mm -hmm. and finding happiness by designing like we talked by designing your day knowing that this simple thing that seems boring is going to give me the results that I want in my life how do you practice gratitude so I have a huge morning routine and I am a stickler for this so what I do is I wake up in the morning I get out and I start to journal I've been journaling for 25 years. What do you journal years. about? Whatever's on the top of my mind. So that, I call that a brain dump. So you just like let everything out. Yeah, there's a great book by Julia Cameron. When I was, it's called The Artist's Way. When I was a young Artist's Way. Artist's Way by okay. Julia Cameron. It's been we'll around for 30 years. She was, I think she was the wife of uh, Martin Scorsese or one of these big directors. And, and it was for writers with writer's block. So you get up and you just brain, what do you call it, a brain dump? Yeah. You just do a brain dump, right? Whatever's on your mind. There's only one rule. You don't stop writing, or two rules. You don't stop writing, you never hit backspace. Oh. So you do this to get the stuff out there. And what I've found over years of doing this, I have thousands of pages, is that once you get that static and that noise, your insecurity, your anxiety, your doubt, the beast out, mm -hmm. you start to get to the good stuff. You start to get to the stuff that's important to you. And that's how I wrote my first and second book and how I wrote you know, 25 movies was through this process of getting rid of the sensor and getting good information out. So I go, now I kind of streamline it, I do it about seven, eight minutes, and I start it off the same way every time. And I say, today is the first day of the rest of my life. Oh. That's, I start that sentence and I say, okay. That and is, I, that's inspiring to start your day off. Today is the that. first day of the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And then I start writing for a little bit. Then it always goes into, if I do this today, I will have crushed my day. So I set up the guideposts. Then I go, and I write down two or three things I'm grateful for okay. today. And again, this is a simplicity. I'm, I, I'm grateful to be on your podcast today. I'm grateful to have another day on the planet. I'm, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for my sister giving this, uh, us this space. Then I also write down one or two things from yesterday that were cool. Because what we focus on in our life grows. Yep. So I'll go back and say, oh, yesterday, you know, I got through my to-be list my to-do list, I got a good sweat in, I took a moment and meditated, I got time with my, my, uh, my girlfriend, I called my son. Uh, someone yesterday just sent me a, a message saying, oh, your book F dying, I cried, I wept, I laughed, it changed my life. Aww. So I was like, yes, thank mm -hmm. you. So I, I shine a light on those and then I go, out and I go out and plan out my day. But that's how gratitude is in each part of my day. Okay. What is the most shameless thing you've done to build your life? Because the tagline of the Mommy Millionaire podcast is be shameless in pursuing your ambitions. So what's the craziest thing you've done to really put your name out there? Nitro. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. My, my sister You're Debbie had to walk away. <laughs> co co cover your ears, honey. She, my, my sister's covering her ears. 
I think when I was younger, coming out of football, hungry to make it in show business, I didn't let rejection stop me as much as I do now because now I feel like I have more to lose and I have pride. So that's something that I deal with. When I was younger, when I moved up uh, to get into Hollywood after playing professional football, I mean, I would go knock on casting directors' doors, I would slip pictures, I would do all this stuff because I wasn't, you know, I was just this guy trying to make right. it. Now I've had success, the danger for me is to fall in the trap of not putting myself out there enough. I know this doesn't answer your question directly. Um, I like that. So why why aren't you putting yourself out there more? I am now. I'm okay, here. Okay, you are. Yeah, yeah, I, I am yeah. now. Be we're well, at Patch be Coffee. We're at pa <laughs> because, you know, when I first started, uh, I do a Facebook Live show uh, Tuesday through Fridays on my Dan Nitro Clark Facebook page. When I first started, you know, getting in the camera, speaking and giving out tools from Nitro's toolbox, it was hard for me because I said, you know what? I've stood in the center of 75,000 people when I was playing football and I had a huge audience. I sold out, I, the American Gladiators, we did a tour. We sold out Madison Square Garden. I was there with 16,900 people. I'd walk on the floor, the fans would erupt. And I said, now I'm talking into a camera mm -hmm. on a hill mm -hmm. <laughs> to nobody. Right. You know, so that was, that was, a. Uh, it was hard. Pride can become your enemy. A hundred percent. What would you say to me? Coach me up. Pride would become my enemy. Well, what I would say is, what would you what would you tell one of your clients? For me, I had to go back to purpose. I had to go back to purpose and say, I want to impact people and I want to change lives. And this right now, in this modern day age, is the way is, to do yeah. it. And set a new goal for myself, which I have. If I can just change one person's life today, boom, mm -hmm. success. I love that. Somebody told me this a piece of advice a couple weeks ago, and I cannot remember who it was, so if you're listening. It was probably me. Maybe it was you. <laughs> but they said, I love you so much, I don't care what you think. And I loved that because, you know, even us, like, we can care so much about what we think about ourselves and our pride being hurt and our ego being hurt. But we have to love ourselves enough to go out there and become that person that we know that we're destined to be. And no matter how many, how crazy it looks, you know, and how crazy it might feel to us while we're doing it. But um, there's so many people that are going to be impacted by your story, by your message. And so I just want to honor you for coming all the way down here to Orange County, your hometown, and taking the time to share this awesome stuff with us because everything sounds so simple and you've created something so amazing with your life and it's really truly like inspiring to see everything that you've overcome and how you've, you're not done. You're, you're continuing to go and you're continuing to impact so many people's lives to make themselves better. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. And it's interesting, you know, having a heart attack five, six years ago, there's an urgency. And a lot of people mm. have said to me, oh my, that must have been you know, sad or miserable. I said, no, it's really helped me quantify time. Where I look and I say, I'm 55. My dad died at 58. My, his brother died at 59. I said, I have three years and I outlive them. And if I do the math, I do the math, someone who's had a heart attack before they are 50 years old, right? Their life expectancy is like 15 years after that because obviously the pool. So I just look at it as a sense of urgency. I don't look at, at it as, um, as something remorseful. I say, okay, look, if, if the numbers prove right and I've got maybe 20 more Christmases left, 20 more vacations, oh, that just gave me chills. 20 more summers, I'm gonna be damn sure mm -hmm. that I'm gonna be doing things with the people I love, the things that I want to, because I, I know that, I just know that this time isn't guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So if you're at home, you need to have a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm because I was the most healthy guy, I was the most fit guy, I was the guy that a life-threatening illness could never happen to. Mm -hmm. I was bulletproof, and it happened like that. Wow, well, you guys heard it from Dan Nitro Clark. Create some urgency in your life, go out there and get what you want. If you guys loved this podcast episode, comment below and let me know what you loved. And take a screenshot if you're listening to the podcast episode and share it out there on all the social media channels. And make sure to tag Kayla Craft 
and Dan Nitro Clark on Instagram so we can repost it and really get this message about living your best life now out there into more people's ears. Thanks you guys so much. I just want to give you a kiss and Yay! say thank you. <laughs> Thanks thank for you. Me.